Welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Impact of Medication Management on a Health System's Growth Strategy. I'm Mackenzie Garrity with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We look forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you use to log into today's webinar to access the recording. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenters. Michael Brown is the Vice President of Managed Services for Cardinal Health. Mike's 30-year healthcare industry career includes helping hospitals and health systems meet strategic priorities by leveraging the pharmacy's impact across the organization. An expert on the many facets of cost control that the pharmacy represents, Michael also has extensive insight and expertise on drug utilization management and compliance monitoring. As Vice President of Managed Services, Mike is responsible for inpatient and outpatient operations and performance of hundreds of hospitals and health systems of every size and type across the nation. Mike is a member of the American Society of Health System Pharmacists and a published author. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in pharmacy at St. Louis College of Pharmacy. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Adam Burek, uh, Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for Post Acute Medical. Dr. Burek joined Post Acute Medical in 2014. His direct oversight includes pharmacy, physician credentialing, digital health, physician development and employment, the hemodialysis program, and merger and acquisition activity. Dr. Burek is a board certified general surgeon whose career has spanned private practice and academics before transitioning to administrative medicine. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Mike to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Mackenzie. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone on the phone for joining this webcast today. I hope you find it stimulating and interesting and looking forward to questions at the end. Um, first thing I'd like to do is go over some discussion highlights that, that we're going to be reviewing today. The first one is what makes some mergers and acquisitions successful? And then we're going to get into how one health system met the strategic, their strategic initiatives through culture and collaboration and how they standardize their medication management practices throughout the system. And then we'll go into a topic around how medication management best practices can help you with your growth strategies. First of all, just kind of give you some background. Everyone knows that uh, our industry is, is experiencing shifting demands, and administrators today uh, have to focus on new performance metrics that probably didn't exist in the past. What's driving those, especially when it comes to pharmacy, is there's multiple regulatory challenges that we're facing. An example of that this year with the new USP 800 standards that are coming out. But there's many regulations that keep, keep being uh, posted that we have to respond to. Everyone knows that we're faced with reimbursement challenges. We're going to have to decrease our costs, but improve our quality, and how are we going to address those? We're experiencing a transitional care where we're seeing a shift in patients where they traditionally were treated are now going out into community-based facilities, and that's make, causing a change on how our practices work. There's many more changes. Um, these were just a few I wanted to highlight here. But in order for administrators to be successful with their systems, there's an appealing solution out there through an M&A strategy that, that they believe can help them. If you really drive into what's going on with that, you're seeing a consolidation trend. And I, I truly understand why leaders would look at that because they're seeing opportunities where they can improve operational efficiencies, cost savings, and really creating a strategic advantage for their networks uh, by doing an M&A strategy. So I want to go over a couple stats for you. In year 2018, 90 hospitals announced a merger or an acquisition. Um, there's a, a group out there that really looks at the healthcare future, and they're predicting that only 50% of the current healthcare systems will rightly still be here in 10 years. And that's a pretty dramatic shift that we're looking going into the future. Now, with all this going on, uh, a recent study found that for hospitals that have been acquired two years post-transition, they are experiencing a decline in operating margins and revenue. And what we want to talk about today is 
you know, how can a hospital beat those odds? How can they really hit their strategic goals that they're setting for the systems? So what makes a successful M&A strategy? You know, I pulled a couple of studies and looked at them and, and some of the things that we do or what we talk to our people about. It really boils down to you have to spend the time on, an, on your integration planning and it's all about execution. And when I say execution, you can boil it down into kind of four key areas. Number one, you have to have a clear strategy. What do you want to look like when you're done with your acquisition or your merger? And you need to communicate that to everyone involved. You have to focus on culture. You need to be driving a change in that culture when you acquire a new facility or a new, uh, a new system or a new entity. They have to be modified into what you're trying to do as, as a system. And then the third one is really project management. It's very important. Um, and it's key to have metrics, to track those metrics, and to continually monitor those metrics to sustain in the results that you're trying to, trying to achieve. And finally, you want to look for areas that you can standardize system-wide and implement best practices system-wide. And for this conversation, we're really going to talk about how did we look at medication management protocols and procedures and implement them system-wide, and how did those lead to success? I want to talk a little bit about medication management because, of course, I'm a pharmacist. I truly believe that a good medication management process can help any system with their integration and with their standardization. The primary areas that it will focus on, it will improve outcomes, it will improve quality, and it will decrease your costs. But it's very important to, to achieve those and to maintain those. You have to implement best practices system-wide and constantly monitor them. I always tell people that, you know, it makes sense for medication management to, to be important for a system because if you really think about it, medication spans across all service lines. There's really no patient that comes into a facility, inpatient or outpatient, that's probably not on some kind of medication or prescribed some kind of, some kind of medication. So that's why pharmacy can have a big impact on your operating expense and quality care. If you implement good, uh, best practices, you can improve pro profitability that leads to ba better patient outcomes and patient care. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Adam Burek, and he's going to tell us some of the successes they've had with post-acute medical. Dr. Burek? Great. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate it. Before we get into some of the details of the case study, I wanted to share with you a little bit about our company. Uh, post-acute medical was founded in 2006. And since that time, we now currently own and operate 25 long-term acute care specialty hospitals, 18 inpatient rehabilitative hospitals, in conjunction with 22 outpatient facilities throughout the United States. We have five more rehabilitation hospitals that are currently under development throughout the United States as well. Our culture, Mike referenced, you know, I'm gonna sum it up for you in one sentence. And if you take care of the patient, everything else takes care of itself. That's something that we believe in our company and has held us in good stead over the last 13 years. Not only from a company perspective, but even for those physicians that may be on the webinar, when you, when you visit with a patient and you make that patient feel like they're the only patient in the room, and then you replicate that 30 more times, you're going to be successful. Mike referenced our strategy and our growth strategy, and we have been very fortunate here at Post-Acute Medical uh, to have thrived in an ever-changing regulatory environment. From an acquisition perspective, two months ago, we closed a deal in purchasing three inpatient rehabilitative hospitals, and we were able to close that deal and, and take over the management of those facilities all at once. So we took three hospitals on at once. In that particular deal, we had some lead time, in fact, close to a year. So we knew what was coming and what the expectations were, and our partner, Cardinal Health, and looking at the pharmacy knew that as well. So that implementation, fortunately, went very well. So we figured, if that went well, why not triple it? So 24 days ago, we closed on a deal where we purchased nine long-term acute care specialty hospitals scattered throughout the United States. We had a 60-day notice in this particular deal. So you can imagine the uncertainty that we had trying to onboard new employees, 
work with their PTO and their benefits, pharmacy licensure issues, and staffing. But really, having a team that was able to do that with us at the exact same time, take on nine new facilities and go live day one, really took a lot of pressure off of me and the senior executive team and allowed us to concentrate on the other factors that go into um, acquiring nine hospitals in a day. Outside of our acquisitions, we have a robust, uh, robust development team where our facilities continue to grow organically as well. Um, we're able to do that from, with some significant economy of scale at this point in our company's history. We have standardization, which I'll talk about a little bit more in detail, and how we went ahead and strategically continued to grow. In terms of culture, we really feel that teamwork is an absolute key. And the culture that we've set up in our, in our company is kind of opposite a lot of companies. When you look at an organizational chart, or people talk about a company's organization, traditionally we think of a pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid is the chief executive officer of the company. And the next layer down is the senior executive team to the chief executive officer. In our company, we flip that pyramid completely upside down. Where our CEO is at the bottom of that pyramid, our senior executive team is the next layer up. And it, our culture is this. Instead of people reporting to us, we support them. So it is our responsibility in the company from an executive leadership perspective to support everyone in the company that would report to us and give them the tools they need to do their job. And when we look for a strategic partner, we want someone that has the exact same philosophy. So we feel that that is crucial to our success and it's something that we'll continue to look to in the future. Mike mentioned the role of medication management previously. With all of our acquisitions, we need to go through the same schemata. The documentation and due diligence period, where folks are working with our regulatory attorneys and our licensure attorneys to make sure all the documents are in sight. There's significant regulatory oversight for all of our hospitals in 2019 and cardinal subject matter experts have folks from the Joint Commission and CMS on their team to make sure that all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. The clinical support comes from working with cardinal subject matter experts, the chief medical officer of the company, myself, our chief clinical officer, and our chief quality officer. If you take all of those together in advance and wrap them together, that then allows us to have a day one strategy that when we take over a given facility, we're able to run it from soup to nuts, just like the facilities we currently run because of the combined teamwork of those departments. In preparing to integrate our new facilities, we, uh, we really start at the very beginning of the planning stage. So I'll give you an example. In de novo builds that we're gonna do, the due diligence appears well prior to opening in fact, we involve the pharmacy team in our blueprints. So we look at schematics with them, decide how large the pharmacy should be, where it should be located, the type of equipment that's necessary for us, so we can build it right the first time. So when we step out of the pharmacy and you go down the hall toward the nursing stations, there we have assistance with what type of automated dispensing equipment we're gonna have, where it's gonna be located, how far the nurses are gonna have to walk, and even making sure that we have the maintenance agreements in place so that equipment will run to its full potential. After the deal is done and the hospital has been opened, we have support for the on-site staff. So each hospital that we open has a dedicated manager from a pharmaceutical perspective that they can call upon 24-7, 365. And we insist in our company that day one when we take over a hospital looks like day 90 and it should be completely seamless. Remember, the teams at these hospitals that we acquire are nervous. They're nervous about their new owners. There's a great deal of uncertainty that exists when a new company comes into a facility. And we want to put them at ease and provide them a sense of confidence when we walk into our facilities. And showing them that this is a streamlined integration from day one really garners a lot of uh, support from the team. In the best practice scenario, standardization is key as we move forward. And 
we have an antimicrobial stewardship program, like all other health companies, because four years ago the federal government had mandated that that be the case. So we have a corporate committee as well. The corporate committee uh, is served by two co-chairs, myself as the chief medical officer and a subject matter expert with Cardinal Health. Um, in conjunction with both of us, we have invited leading doctors throughout our company, infectious disease doctors, pulmonologists, internal medicine physicians, critical care physicians, and general surgery. And that group of individuals reviews the latest literature and in this particular case, I'll limit the discussion to creating a list of restricted antimicrobials. So that body creates that. Then, we don't stop there though. Most health systems create this list of restricted drugs and then allow it to be pushed down. But here's what we do in our company that has really worked very well for us. Any physician, even a physician if they're an ID doctor or a critical care doctor that writes for a restricted antimicrobial, has that antimicrobial reviewed by the pharmacy in conjunction with the subject matter experts at Cardinal Health. If in fact that the cultures and the sensitivities and the clinical scenario play out that that's the appropriate medication, fantastic. However, in the rare case that there is a disparate where we think that there might be a better drug or there might be a way to de-escalate the type of antimicrobial this patient's getting, I then get involved at that point and review the clinical case both with Cardinal Health and the prescribing physician. And we discuss the evidence-based literature, what may or may not be an appropriate alternative therapy, and then come up with a therapeutic plan for that patient. And we found that this process does several things for us, but really it assures the latest evidence-based medicine and care for our patients while decreasing the incidence of multidrug resistant organisms and ultimately the cost of care for our patients. So oversight has been key for us. In terms of getting patients admitted to our facilities, um, we have never denied any appropriate admission in the last four years due to a pharmacy shortcoming. And that's even amidst, even amidst some of the national drug shortages that have occurred throughout the United States. And there's, there's a reason for that. Um, first of all, the patients that come into inpatient rehab hospitals and long-term acute care specialty hospitals are expected. There's absolutely no shock and awe in these folks showing up at our door. We don't have emergency departments. So we know who's coming in advance. So why not prepare for that patient's arrival prior to their arrival? So our pharmacists and our field navigators that go out and look for our patients in our facilities and do our clinical evaluations collaborate, collaborate on the medication management, what the patient is currently on and what their clinical status is. And if you combine that and collaborate with this chief executive officer of the individual hospital, as long as the accepting physician, you'll find that that proactive planning uh, will assure that there are no hiccups or speed bumps when that patient's admitted, that they'll have the medications that they need at the time they need it. So thanks to that planning and the resourcefulness of the Cardinal team, we haven't had to deny a patient in four straight years. You know, the process I just described also works a little bit in reverse. And I'll give you an example of that. <clears throat> We had a patient that was referred to one of our long-term acute care specialty hospitals. And the story from the navigator team to the chief executive officer went like this. We have a 46-year-old male on a vent ventilator who's had a tracheostomy and has pneumonia. And for those of you on the WebEx that have had experience with LTACs, that is the perfect patient, particularly with their long previous ICU stay. So appropriately, the CEO at that point said, fantastic, bring them in. So about an hour, hour and a half after that decision was made, I actually got a call from the pharmacist at the facility. And the pharmacist called me and asked me a question. They said to me, we're preparing, we're thinking about bringing this patient in and we're looking through the medication list. And I just wanted to ask you, Dr. Burek, when you dose FK506, when do you draw the levels and how often do you have to adjust that medication's dosage? So immediately I paused and said, well, why are they on this medication? 
oh, well, they're on that medication from their lung transplant. Well, when did they have their lung transplant? A month ago. Okay. They read off the other list of medications that the patient's on, and I said, well, what else is wrong with them? They have pneumonia. I said, okay, so now we have an individual that is immunosuppressed with a fresh bilateral lung transplant that has pneumonia in the new lungs. So immediately at that point, we cease that admission. A patient like that belongs in their university health care system, not in a freestanding long-term acute care hospital. So I think that call from the pharmacist probably saved that patient's life at this point. So having that collaborative team together not only assists you in bringing admissions into the hospital, it helps as a safety net to stop patients that may not belong in our, our facilities at the time. Remember, from the beginning of our slides, taking care of the patient is the right thing to do all the time. So if you were to ask me, you know, what are your thoughts on jumpstarting your growth strategy, or how did post-acute manage to do that? And I would tell you that there are two things that I found to be vital. One is our culture of collaboration and integration. When you walk into one of our hospitals today, you will find our pharmacists and members of the pharmacy team involved in all aspects of a patient's care, including their interdisciplinary team. The only way you would know the difference that these pharmacists are employed by Cardinal Health is if you got to look at their paycheck. So I think it's vital and essential that if you, you, when you're looking to do something like this that's been successful for our company, you really want to look for a true partner and not a vendor. There's a huge distinction amongst the two. The second thing is that Mike mentioned earlier, is standardization. In 2019, you're not applauded as a clinician for picking the right blood pressure medication. It's really scripted. And we standardize all of our processes throughout our hospital. It goes back to <clears throat> decreasing the incidence of error and providing the best possible clinical care. So when, when you're looking to look for a pharmacy service provider and looking for reasons of why you should or should not do it, think of it this way. There are many areas, at least in my particular case, of oversight. Pharmacy was one of them. And the 5,000 physicians we have credentialed in our hospitals is, you know, another piece of it, along with some other aspects. But remembering as a clinician, my area of expertise is in prescribing medications, not purchasing them, distributing them, and making sure that the rules and regulations are up to snuff. Um, Mike mentioned a regulation earlier called USB, what was it, Mike? 800. USB 800. Well, USB to me means something that I can connect my smartphone to so it doesn't run out of batteries. So having experts in the field um, are absolutely key. So Cardinal, in addition to doing a lot of that work for us on the regulatory side, does mock joint commission surveys and submits any plans of correction if they're necessary. So in a partnership, I think collaboration and integration are key. Availability is certainly a huge key and having access to your resources um, one of my favorite stories about that is we had a patient in one of our long-term acute care specialty hospitals that was very, very sick on a mechanical ventilator, receiving some significant sedation, and they were running out of this particular medication. It happened to be Christmas Eve at 6 o'clock at night, and they were going to need to transfer this patient back to the acute care setting because of the availability of this medicine. So I was able to pick up my cell phone and call a member of the executive team at Cardinal Health, who picked up the phone immediately, was as pleasant as and engaging as you can imagine, and in a very short period of time, I got a return phone call that the medication itself is being delivered to the hospital right now. I was able to call the attending pulmonologist taking care of that patient back within an hour and explain to him how he no longer has to worry about the availability of medications for his sick ICU patient and can now focus on doing the very best care for that patient. That is key in any partnership. The other thing that we spoke about earlier is our mission. Both partners have to have the same mission and the same relationship. It's a two-way street. So whether it be a parent-child, a husband-wife, 
or a company relationship, it has to be both sided. So it allows me to sleep better at night, that's for sure, knowing that I have a lot of assistance and backup in the pharmacy, pharmaceutical realm. Mike? Thoughts? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Burek. Um, I do have a few questions I'd like to go over. That was a, a great overview of what you're doing at Post-Acute Medical, so thank you for that. Um, these are some questions that, that I just want to put out there to ask and so the group can kind of benefit from, from them. And then we're going to go to a question and answer. But um, first one is, how does your hospital measure performance? I mean, what do you, how do you know what good looks like? You know, Mike, um, good, good, we're, we're not really familiar with the term good. We're really looking for great and great to elite in our company. But to answer your question, really, we look at several metrics, and the first being the patient experience. So we have a vast network of individuals within our company that look at that on a daily basis. The second, I would say, is consistency, but the consistency extends throughout all of our disciplines. So consistency in our nursing care, our physical therapy care, consistency in our revenue. All of these things are, as an example, are watched on a daily basis very closely as our metrics. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one is, you know, what are your hospital drivers for innovation? I mean, what are you looking for? I put up there reactive versus proactive. Can you give me some examples of how you do that? Sure. The, the reactive piece is something that we try and avoid, but we certainly learn from it. And the more we learn from our reactions, the more proactive we can be and visionary so we don't continue to, uh, to do the same thing over and over again and learn from those opportunities. But really, Mike, I think the key to this is the standardization that we discussed earlier. Because once you have things that are standardized throughout your entire health system, medication management being a great example, then you can consolidate those resources. And once that occurs, that leads to true innovation. And an example of that that, that, uh, that I can give you is this. Now that I have your team's oversight of the pharmacy division, that allow, frees up a lot of my time to go out and do merger and acquisition activity or develop new programs in our company. We're looking at doing some different things in dialysis and telemetry and other aspects of healthcare that I can really leverage my influence as a physician and my expertise as a physician on rather than worrying about regulatory issues and so on. So really the drivers for innovation to us have really been the standardization consolidation and freeing up my time to do other things that are valuable to our system. Okay, thank you for that. The last one for me is, uh, what resources does your clinical teams need to become change agents? Well, we've done a couple things in that regard, Mike. One of the things that we started with um, and have developed internally we call PAM University or Post-Acute Medical University, which is an internal training program and resource for our employees uh, to progress. So there's learning modules, there's leadership modules, but really we give people the tools that they need uh, to become change agents, including creating a CEO boot camp where we're putting together a series of steps, classes, as well as apprenticeships for folks that are interested in leadership and eventually ending up becoming a chief executive officer um, under the umbrella of the folks that have already been through those routes and have learned a lot of things. And, you know, one of the other things that we've done in terms of change agents, from my perspective at least as the chief medical officer, is the physician's change in behavior. We provide them with a lot of tools, a lot of evidence-based literature, condense things for them because they're very, very busy. So we're able to consolidate and send out emails with updates, particularly on pharmaceuticals. So the education piece is huge, but also the oversight is huge. Doctors now know that when they write an, an order for a restricted antimicrobial that we're going to double check it. And in some cases, it's been a, a situation where, as physicians know, they're being watched and have significant oversight. Some of the old patterns and behaviors are able to change. So I think those are probably some of the key things that we've done. And we find the more that we train our employees, the more successful our company becomes. Thank you, Dr. Burek. Uh, Those are the questions I had. Uh, it sounds like the medication management programs you're putting in at Post-Acute Medical are really driving success and helping to your future growth, and I look forward to working with you to continue that. 
with that, I'd like to turn this back over to you, Mackenzie, and open it up to whoever on the phone if they may have some questions for myself or for Dr. Burek. Thank you, Mike and Dr. Burek, for that fantastic presentation. We'll now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into your Q&A box you see on your dashboard. We'll try to get through as many questions as we have possible. And it looks like we have a few coming in already. Um, our one audience member wants to ask, I want to get my pharmacy more involved with admissions and, trans and transitions of care. What made your program successful in doing this? You know what, I'm going to take that one, Dr. Beery, because I, I think you really asked that, uh, answered that question in your presentation on how you really look at patients as they come in and what the process is. I'll answer it a little bit from some of my experience in the other hospitals that we manage that may not have the same process where they're dealing with an emergency room or something like that. Um, typically, we, we like to do a med rec, if, if at all possible. They, tip, they usually are technician-based. Um, in the instances where, you know, with after hours, we utilize remote remote pharmacy uh, a lot. Um, I know PostCube utilizes that also, um, but that can be a significant driver or a significant help to manage that process when you don't have a pharmacist on site. And that's, in my experience, where you have issues with people coming in that you don't really know what they're on is on the weekend. And I can't stress enough having the ability to have 24-7 pharmacy coverage through a remote service that helps with that and can help the, the nurses in the ER or the nurses on the floor identify uh, medication records as they move into the, into the facility. Yeah, and Mike, I couldn't agree with you more. In addition to having the 24-hour remote pharmacy services, our company also has our navigator team working 24-7 as well. So we're able to have someone with a clinical background go out and ex assess the patient in conjunction with the medication reconciliation to be able to bring that individual into our hospital and be well prepared to do such. The, f the nursing team also, once the patient is admitted, always has the backup of that pharmacist if there's a question or a concern about them dispensing a medication. So it's worked out great for our company. Good question. Great, thanks for those insights. Um, the next question is asking us to dive a little deeper. How would you, how do you specifically collaborate with the nurse at the point of service with patients? Well, it's, it's done two ways. Um, it, there's a direct communication, obviously. Uh, if you have a, a, a the pharmacist on site, they directly communicate with the nurse. But once again, if the pharmacy is closed for after hours, is which we deal with quite a bit in, at post acute Medical and some of the other facilities, it's through a remote pharmacy where they have a phone that they can call and talk to. Now, there's a whole host of why nursing's talking to pharmacy, whether it's um, just drug information or dosing guidelines, uh, missing drug, whatever. Uh, we just may, want to make sure that there's a lines of communication open for that. Now, there's formal processes, especially within you know post acute, where nursing is absolutely involved in what our medication management practices are because we expect them to know the drugs that are on our formulary, how they're supposed to be administered, um, is there if they ever see anything that's out of the ordinary or unusual to make sure that they feel comfortable enough to report back to us as a pharmacy team to, to help them and in, into the system. I always look I always say that nurses are probably our number one customer because that's who we deal with the most um, just because they take care of the patients uh, 24 7 so hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. The next audience member wants to know, how do you achieve 100% compliance with physicians on clinical initiatives? Well, that's, a, that's a great question. And here's what we found to be successful, um, involving the physicians prior to the initiative beginning. So remembering physicians as a whole are problem solvers on steroids. So if you present them with something, they need to fix it. Think about what they do every day. Go into a patient's room, and in a five or 10 minute visit, have to come up with a diagnosis, a treatment plan, and then document it, and then move on to the next room and repeat that behavior all day long. So I usually start out a conversation with our physicians. If we're gonna have an initiative, let's say, on antihypertensives, 
um, I get a group of our physicians together on a call and start out the conversation with, I need your help. And this is what we need to achieve. How do you think we can best do that? Can we take a look through these medications together and can I get your thoughts and your input as to what you think and what you've seen in your practices? So I'm doing that on the call with the subject matter experts of Cardinal to help guide us. And at the conclusion of one of those calls, for example, I might be able to pare down a long list of antihypertensives to, anti to just a few. So after that occurs, when it's rolled out to the local pharmacy and therapeutics committees at the hospitals, it's widely and quickly accepted because the folks that are on those committees are the folks that develop the policy. And from a pharmacy's perspective, once that policy is developed on what the formulary decision is, it, it, we rapidly implement that into our policy and procedures all the way from the person buying the drug, making sure it's the, you know we're getting the right drug, getting it on formula, having it in stock, making sure that the things that's been eliminated aren't there, where there's at least control on the access to it. And then, once again, it gets back to that whole educational program. This is what we're going to use for this, this, this therapy. This is how it's to be used. And it's, it's really a, a cross um, practices, for, whether it be nursing, physicians, pharmacy, technicians, buyer. Everyone needs to understand that's the decision, and then we need to implement and track that and monitor that. So it becomes an execution uh, piece from our standpoint. Thanks, Mike Thanks and Dr. Burek. We're, we're getting a ton of great questions, and this next audience member is saying that they're having a difficulty getting buy-in from non-hospitalist providers. How are your pharmacists able to collaborate well with providers? Sure. Um, that, that, that is a difficult uh, thing to do. And I've always believed that physicians are in the business to taking care of their, their patients. And I try to approach it from that standpoint that I'm there to help them take care of their patients. And if you can really show them evidence-based um, and kind of give them the understanding why, typically they will move. Now, there's always the five percenters that are kind of they're, they're stuck in their own ways. Um, there's a couple ways that we'll go about it or I'll go about it. One, I'm consistent. They hired me to do this job, so I'm consistent. I don't give up um, until, until my customer, who's usually an administrator, tells me to back off. But I will leverage the administration. Um, I, I find the chief medical officer, uh, like Dr. Burek, and say, hey, this is what we're trying to do. This is what we decided on. This is an individual a physician that I need help with. Can you help me? And we'll devise a plan to go after that person. Um, yeah, you're always you – I'd like to, we're having 100 percent post acute. My other ones, but I don't have 100 percent in because they do have physicians that aren't employed. That's understandable. But uh, and there's certain times that you don't want to push that envelope. But it is a constant, never give up attitude, given the scientific based information, and then leveraging your administrative staff to help you get that. And it's easy to say that you can go up into the C-suite and say, hey, Mr. CEO, I need you to back me on that. You have to go into that C-suite and say, here's the facts. This is appropriate. This is what we're trying to do. This is how it matches what you want to do as a facility. And bring that information to them. Make yourself valuable to that administrator and so they don't feel like they're just out there on their, <clears throat> on their own talking to a physician because they're not going to be comfortable talking about medication therapy. They have to be equipped to help talk about medication therapy. So you need to be the value in that, and they can come in and help you with some of these physicians that don't want to come on board. Yeah, and Mike, I'll add to that. I think the chief executive officer should look to their chief medical officer or other medical administrators to assist them. I can give a, a CEO of one of our hospitals a script, and they can read it verbatim. And I can get on the phone and read the exact same script, and they accept that from me and not from the administrator. And the reason is I'm their colleague. So I am a physician, and I understand what they're going through, and I understand their questions. So one of the things I, I do with post-acute medical is I'll get on the phone and have a conversation with them, but then get people in the same specialty with me. So if we're talking about you know, an antihypertensive, maybe I'll have one of our nephrologists or one of our internists get on the phone with me. 
And then I'll say, listen, you know, I'm a general surgeon by training, but I brought these folks with me to help me. Please share with me what your questions or concerns are related to this medication. And I'll tell you, um, by the time we get off the phone, we have synergy. All good points. Thanks. Our next question is, what is your experience with pharmacist-driven provider-based clinics at 340B sites? Are you seeing any growing trends? Pharmacist-based? I guess what Ian is doing. Um, I see pharmacy, I see trends where clinics are putting pharmacies in, especially in community, community health centers or, or where the federally qualified health centers are. Um, that's a growing trend uh, where they're putting a pharmacist in there. They're unique from my experience in that they're not, they're not a traditional retail operation. They're more of a quasi-clinical advisory retail operation where they work directly with the physicians in the clinic um, to help really come up with what is the care plans for the, the patients of that clinic. And then they, they put those together and they provide them the medications and typically they get the refills there because they're, they're, um, they're, they have a pharmacy. Now that's a great advantage to a clinic that's 340B qualified because uh, it, it can be a nice little revenue stream for that facility that they can uh, reinvest in, in their clinic and, and add programs to it. So I hope that answers what you are, but yeah, I do see that growing. I see it being a big need. Um, the last stat I looked at from the community health clinics, there's about 9,000 of them around the United States, and I know probably less than 20% of them have pharmacies. Thanks, Mike. Um, the next question is, does pharmacy make daily rounds with the care manager and nurses? It really depends on the facility and what they want to do. But, yeah, for the most part, we probably, we, well, especially around antibiotics. I know in most of our facilities we make rounds on antibiotics to find out what's going on. Um, and, and that's, if you still look at the drug classes that, that, my customers are where they're struggling with, and it's the largest spend. Antibiotics are still there, and so we do make rounds. Now, the smaller the hospital, we, we have the ability to, to do virtual rounds uh, where we'll review it virtually and, and then send the information back out to them so they can follow up on it. Uh, that's a big advantage to, to the smaller facilities, especially the, the, the post-acute medical facilities uh, where we have a centralized person who oversees that and then puts the information back out. So it's a combination of traditional, I got a pharmacist up there on the floor working with a physician and the ID uh, physicians and, or a pharmacist that's remote kind of overseeing everything and then sending the information back out. And at post-acute medical, we do a mix of both. Um, our patients that are in our intensive care units and high observation area units have pharmacists making rounds on them and making sure that they're that everything is going in the right direction, integrating with our nurses and our physicians because those folks are usually on so many medications and most of them being intravenous. From rounding on the floors every day and working with case managers and nurses, more so as it becomes time for discharge where me uh, medication reconciliation comes into play and making sure that the patients understand from not only the nurses, but from the pharmacists, what they're taking, why they're taking it, what to look out for, and making them aware of any interactions. Not only drug-to-drug -drug interactions, but interactions with food, as an example. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's what we do at Post-Acute. Our another audience, audience member wants to know, how do you validate your measures, and what are major quality measures you have adopted for pharmacy services? We have two two measures that uh, two types of measures. One is that we actually just track everything we purchase, everything we utilize. We we put it up against DRGs, and we put it up against we track it by physician ordering physician, and then we benchmark everything. So that's really what drives a lot of our our clinical programs on just having a firm understanding of what we utilize. 
when we get into some of our quality initiatives, I mean, we're acceptable. Uh, we we look at HCAP scores and we look at what programs we can put in that will help drive some of the pharmacy-based HCAP scores, and, and then track those. And then we have um, a physical kind of an assessment that we do. It's more of a checklist that makes sure that we're under continuous quality improvement. So we're constantly prepared for for Joint Commission or NIHO, whoever you're on. Um, to make sure that uh, that even if they walk through the door, we're going to be there. And that's a process where we'll do an annual audit with um, regular quarterly just sections of audits. So anytime someone from our team walks into a facility, they probably have a list they want to check that's off that that performance plan that we put in place that that we do annually. So um, it's a combination. It's true hard metrics. Uh, a lot of them are very based on financial. Um, and then there's just uh, more of a, uh, a checklist. Of this is to assure that we're doing things right. It goes all the way from making sure you're keeping track of your C2 invoices all the way down to refrigeration logs, um, just the, the basics. So hopefully that helped a little bit. Fantastic. And thank you, everyone, for and again, these great questions. Our next one is, how are you monitoring side effects and how do you monitor side effects and minimize them while optimizing the needed care? Well, most of our side effects, if, if you have them, you have, you, you'll fill out a, a, a form, um, an adverse drug reaction form that gets Submitted back into P and T, and then we just monitor trends. Um, it, it's just that, that's a typical program that we put in everywhere. It does. It's not just side effects. We're looking for other things. But uh, if you see a trend, then we'll dig down into it uh, and see what's causing those trends. Um, just to, I mean, we have key indicators of what we're looking for for drugs that are being dispensed to follow up on, et cetera. But it, it's um, something I don't see a whole lot. Um, yeah, and another one is is that now that I'm thinking about it, you know, when when we hit 24/7, um, we monitor every drug interaction, uh, side effect, whatever. It's done 24/7 because the software program we use it doesn't matter if the pharmacist is in in the hospital; they're using the same software program as when the pharmacy shuts down and the remote pharmacy uses it. So. We track all of that constantly, um, and like I said, it's not just you know, adverse drug reactions, it's everything. Um, wrong dose missing or wrong drug, it's a whole host of things, and then we just report it out on a consistent basis to P&T. Thanks, everyone. That's all the time we have for today. I want to thank Mike and Dr. Burek for their excellent presentation and Cardinal Health for sponsoring today's webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.